So, microphone is on. It's 11.45. Uh, so, of course, as a German moderator, I need to be very punctual here. So, we start right on the spot. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here for our panel. Uh, my name is Jan Ellermann. I'm a senior specialist in Europol's data protection uh, function. And today I'm your host here for this uh, EDEN panel. So for those of you who haven't heard already, EDEN stands for Europol Data Protection Experts Network. So one of the takeaways of this panel here is that EDEN is not a garden, it's a network. And uh, yeah, we are very uh, proud to uh, present this panel to you. Maybe a few words uh, for you to understand what EDEN is all about. Uh, the Europol Data Protection Experts Network was founded in uh, 2016 and ever since we have run annual conferences but also site events so I've uh, done the count here and this event today is the eighth uh, EDEN event uh, we are organizing and EDEN ultimately is all about uh, talking about uh, topics, drawing links between data protection in a law enforcement context but we don't like to limit it to data protection only. So we really also like to look a little bit beyond the end of our own nose and to provide a forum for law enforcement practitioners to meet um, others who are interested in the topic of data protection in a law enforcement context. So uh, when we organize our conferences at Europol headquarters, for instance, uh, we are very happy to see not only law enforcement data protection officers, such as Julia I see here from the Danish police in the audience, but we uh, really welcome, welcome and value also the input from NGOs, from privacy activists, from private party representatives. So to cut it short, regulators, everyone having an interest in uh, data protection and how that works in law enforcement is a very welcome guest in our uh, context. And uh, I'm also happy to announce that the next uh, Eden conference, uh, which I would here label as the second best data protection related conference in the world, uh, right after CPDP, uh, will take place on 19th and 20th of September in The Hague at Europol headquarters. So let's say if all of you who are here, I take it, are interested in data protection and law enforcement. And many, some of you I know have been to Europol headquarters, but if you haven't, that's your chance really to see the organization from the inside. That's your chance to talk to our analysts, to our data protection officer, to my boss, in fact, and to whomever you want to in order to ask the questions you always wanted to ask. Making the move to today's uh, panel here, we've labeled it as the police can't stop losing you. Fortnite avatars are only the beginning. And at Eden, we have a kind of history to always go for panel titles which have some pop cultural background. So the police uh, title was a good starting point, definitely. We also, if you look at the beginning of our year, there was some EDPS deletion order directed towards Europol. There was an admonishment in 2020, so we felt like we might be losing some of our fans in the data protection and privacy community. So hence, it's a good uh, occasion, let's say, to be here and to uh, uh, continue the debate on this important topic. Uh, the business case we brought to you here today is one which I think is really innovative is really creative and is really out of the box. So um, uh, the people on stage, three out of four at least, uh, have a direct link to the Fortnite avatar. Having said that, I think all of you are French, right? Isn't it? Yeah. So it's the most French panel I've ever moderated in my life. So I shall say something like, uh, Bienvenue participants, uh, bien, bienvenue cher uh, panelists. And that's as French as it's going to get today, at least from my side. Um, uh, but more seriously, I'm very happy to see here um, uh, on the right-hand side uh, Veronique uh, Béchu. So Veronique is the head of the Child Protection uh, Unit of the French National Police. And she's accompanied by uh, Isabelle Debré here to my right. And Isabelle is the president of an NGO uh, on child protection, which is called L'Enfant Bleu. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my <laughs> good job. Good job. <laughs> I mean, it's also a language exercise, this panel here for me. So, um, next to her right hand side, that's um, uh, Fabrice Plazol. He's the chief creative officer of uh, Hava Play, and that's an advertising company which played a very active uh, role here in this context. And on the very hand, uh, right hand side, that's my uh, colleague and uh, friend Greg Monnier. And uh, Greg is running the Innovation Lab at uh, Europol. So the purpose is to first uh, show you what the famous Fortnite undercover avatar is all about. And then we can also discuss about it. Um, uh, and Greg is also here, let's say, to contextualize it. And if we then want to even look a bit beyond, if we want to look at things like policing the metaverse, uh, then I think we have all the experts here in stage, on stage to do that. Uh, my last word for now is, uh, we are privileged here to be in a rather small setting. We are not on the biggest stage here, and um, uh, while for a rock star that might be a disappointment, for me it's encouraging because you are all very close. So we can really have a lively debate, and I would encourage you, um, if, if you have a burning question, then by all means, please just raise your hand and also feel free to interrupt us. But uh, uh, normally we go for presentations, and afterwards uh, we have a hopefully lively debate. Thank you very much for being here, and I hand over to the first speaker uh, of the day, who's going to be Isabel, right? Isabel. Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry for my English. I'm going to try to speak English, but it's not very easy for me, hmm. as you, and French. <laughs> you, you understand? Okay. L'Enfant Bleu is a non-profit association created in 1989. I've been a volunteer for 30 years, and I became president four years ago. Our mission is to fight against any form of, ch of child abuse, whether physical, psychological, or sexual. Our action consists in providing psychological and legal support to victims. We also speak in schools to help and raise awareness and act as a civil party in tri trials, which allows us to alert on institutional dysfunctions. In France, more than 50,000 children and teenagers are victims of at least one of these forms of abuse each year. A tw uh, 2018 study showed that in France, one child dies every five days. And I can assure you that it's a conservative estimation. During the pandemic, because of the lockdown, children were stuck at home, literally jailed with their abusers. As you know, 80% of assault are committed by a family member. Children victimized by their own parents had no way out. We were really disparate. Then our partner, Avas, came up with an idea. What about using a video game as a try on horse? We decided to create an avatar in the Fortnite game that could be added as a friend and which home children could chat and warn in case of danger. In less than three weeks, without any advertising, we had about 1,200 connections. We continue to work with Avas as well as, as, as sorry, uh, with different ministers and video game unions to perpetuate this first experience. I will now let Fabrice from Abbas Play take over and explain this in more detail. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, as uh, Isabel said, it all started uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we, we saw a, a tweet from Adrien Taquet. Adrien Taquet is uh, the former 
Secretary of State uh, of, um, dedicated to the children protection in France. And uh, I don't know if you can read the tweet, but uh, he explains that in time of lockdown, the risk of child abuse is in, uh, in home, at home, increases. Uh, and the opportunities to spot are decreasing because uh, we can't, children don't go to school or to sports club and so it's complicated for them to uh, say, oh, uh, I'm an abused children or to speak with adults. So we saw that at the agency and, and we thought about how can we help these children. Um, we spotted two opportunities. These figures are from CEL. CEL is the syndicate of video games in France. 96% uh, of children uh, um, between 10 and 17 years old are playing video games. Occasionally, not every day, but they are playing. So all these young people, all these children play video games. The second opportunity we spotted was 83% of French people let their children play on their own could be a problem, and maybe you will have some discussion about that. But for us, it was an opportunity because when children play, they are alone, and they have not their parents behind their shoulder looking at what they are doing. So we have an audience, a lot of children are playing, and they are playing alone. So if we want to help them and to create some discussion with the children, it was a big opportunity. And so we had the idea, and we said, okay, there are some associations, and Fondry is uh, one of the major associations of uh, children protection in France. What if we brought those who help children to where the children are and can speak freely? And so we went into Fortnite, because Fortnite is one of the major video games played by these children. And moreover, Fortnite is a freemium game. So maybe you don't play, but everyone can play in Fortnite. You can download the app uh, after this meeting, uh, this conference. And uh, it's totally free. You have to pay if you want to buy some skins or to uh, upgrade your character. But you can play on every platform, computer, uh, PlayStation, and it's all free. So it was a major audience um, place to speak to the children. And we present to you Undercover Avatar. Undercover Avatar, it was this uh, character you can see on the right um, who's aimed to protect children. Uh, we have a small video explaining all the operation and after I can explain you the, what you didn't uh, see in the video. Cases of suspected child abuse cannot remain silent. The child is abused or neglected every 36 seconds. Children are suffering in silence. Abused children are unvoiced. They remain silent. Enfant Bleu, a youth protection association, created an avatar in Fortnite. The first in-game player who's not here to play but to talk and detect maltreatment using in-game chats. He frees the speech of abused kids to help them. Here, they feel comfortable and can speak up. Children were invited to add Enfant Bleu by people they trust, streamers and influencers. Vous n'hésitez pas à vous ajouter Enfant Bleu si vous êtes victime ou témoin de violence familiale. task force avec policiers, gendarmes, les associations et moi-même. It allows us to confirm the need for police officers to be present on online video games. European countries have been extremely interested in this project and some would like to put it in place in their countries. The European Commission has invited us to talk about this project in order to present the extent of the program on online video games. We are also discussing a way to continue this avatar. So you saw Veronique in the video and on stage <laughs> two times. Um, 
so we we first created the avatar because um, we, it was the main point of the operation. So we proposed Enfant Bleu to create this uh, character in Fortnite, and we started to create a unique avatar. And we we thought a lot about how it should be represented, etc. And we we decided to create a non-gender avatar. Uh, blue because the association is l'enfant bleu and uh, it was quite difficult because in Fortnite uh, there are a lot of skins that could be frightening with uh, um, weapons or some terrifying things so we wanted to have a character peaceful and so we decided to go uh, with the skin of an angel because we, we, we had to wait the correct skin on the Fortnite uh, store because uh, every day we were like that, okay, not, not for today. And we finally uh, had this character and we, we, created, uh, we created the character and we had a, a media or audience strategy driven towards children because it was very, very important to avoid parents to be aware of this character. So uh, we had to keep it secret from parents and uh, we decided to partner with some esports team in France and with some uh, KOL in France too. And we, we only partnered with KOL and eSports team which audience was uh, under 18 uh, because we had some figures about that and we didn't want a, a big uh, major influencer followed also by parents because it, it, uh, it could be dangerous for the, for the children. Uh, we also, it's a little bit far from you I think, but we also thought with the police and the justice in France, we also build uh, like uh, a way to protect children uh, from uh, people who could create another Enfant Bleu, another character in Fortnite because it was a, it was a risk. Uh, we could have someone uh, creating another character uh, like uh, Enfant underscore Blue, for example. Uh, so we registered all the declination possible of Enfant Bleu on Fortnite. So we have now, I don't know, 100 accounts on Fortnite. Uh, Enfant underscore Bleu, Enfant double underscore Bleu, etc., etc. And we um, explain to all the children, you can recognize him, he looks like that. He has a special emote, it's a dance uh, character do uh, on Fortnite. He wears a bag and he has this specific skin. Influencer, as I told, already played a real key role for sharing because they shared on Instagram, on Twitch, during uh, streaming, etc. But they never let the content online. It was only uh, one hour, two hours, and then they deleted the content and they did another one on the next day to avoid parents to see uh, this content too. And finally, it was a, a really game changer operation because we had were 1,200 uh, children uh, that get in touch with us and uh, we played 30 days non-stop and we had more than 50 volunteers uh, that was uh, involved in the project. Uh, it could be a psychologist in the association, it could be people from the agency who played too, people from the police and it was a really, really uh, massive and uh, team uh, spirit activation. So it was a, a huge, uh, huge history and something uh, very, very uh, strong for the agency and uh, for the association and also for the, for the French police. Um, finally, we revealed our character because it was, it was not scheduled to continue this character. It's not possible. It's uh, too many uh, work and uh, it's, it's not possible to have this character online for years and years. So it was just like a test, a way to express and to say, okay, there is an audience. Children can get in touch with an association and they can uh, say uh, their problems in game. And finally, we, we explained to the world what we did and the avatar became the cause's spokesperson. And we even had some PR uh, issue in uh, Vogue in Japan. So it was a real worldwide operation. It was not only French. Uh, we, we, had the, we were lucky and we were interviewed by Vogue in Japan. So it, it was something uh, borderless and it's very important because all the world, all over the world, it could help some, some children. Veronique, up to you. Hello, everyone. So I, I'm really pleased to be uh, in front of you to talk about this avatar because it was a huge step for um, law enforcement. Uh, first of all, for French law enforcement because we, are, we were involved uh, very closely with the association and, and Avas. Um, first of all, we knew before lockdown that video games were a new way for pedo criminals to groom children. So we had a lot of cases, a lot of reports from all over the world that 
children are groomed on video games, on gaming. So uh, we had an increase of reports about 3,000% uh, just before the lockdown of reports. So uh, we wanted to find a way to have a step for police officers in gaming. And when L'Enfant Bleu called me to be part of the project, I said yes, immediately, because I was so um, impressed by the idea and I was looking for this kind of uh, initiative since a long time. So I, did, I said, okay, let's do it. So for law enforcement, our job in this project was to uh, um, help to know how to be in contact with children, how to ask them uh, what happens um, without subjection in the questions, because the way to interview children, uh, victim of uh, sexual assault or physical assault is a very specific interviewing. So we were here to help of how to get um, clues to be able for prosecutors to go forward and open an investigation. And then after this one shot, after this test and we saw that 1,200 children contacted the avatar. We knew that there is something to do with the gaming. Then with the uh, uh, state secretary, Adrian Take, uh, we decided that um, we had a working group on this team, on, the, on this topic uh, with L'Enfant Bleu, Avas and some other uh, partners to try to find a way to um, be in gaming uh, to help children, to be a point of alert for them, but also for law enforcement to be undercover in a very uh, long time, for a very long time, inside the gaming. So uh, we had this um, new mission uh, since uh, six, uh, almost one year now, and we tried to find a way to uh, go forward the issues, uh, first of all, in data protection, for example, that because it is an issue uh, for this kind of project. And then um, we had been, uh, we had the honor to be awarded by the, the first European Innovation Award. Uh, that was a very, very, uh, a great honor for three of us, for, uh, uh, the association, but also for the, the private company and for law enforcement, because that was uh, the recognition of the involvement for children during the lockdown in an initiative, very good initiative way. Then the consequences for law enforcement are plural, because uh, first of all, uh, that was a very great way to advise public, general public, so parents also, and judicials like prosecutors, investigative judges, that the gaming is now a way for pedo criminals to get in touch with children. And then if you are uh, very connected, you can see that the Sun, the, the, the newspaper, uh, put in, in line, online uh, today an article about uh, uh, Spain do criminals that uh, had groomed through uh, Fortnite during several months uh, 3,000 uh, 3, children, and they, he has been arrested a uh, few days ago by uh, the Spain uh, law enforcement, the Spanish law enforcement. And then this is very, very, very actual and very uh, urgent that we can be inside. The, the, the gaming. So we had an increase of the reports from all over the world since the, the avatar. We have also uh, a lot of intelligence that we can share with the French prosecutors on all, the, the, all over France. And then now they know that we have to work on the, on the gaming. And we open a lot of investigations since the, the Avatar uh, scheme. 
uh, to locate the children and try to get what happened, to know what happened with them and to identify the, the perpetrators. It can be psychological um, violence, but it, it, it's often sexual violence inside the families. We trained and accredited a lot of undercover agents in France to be able to uh, play <laughs> on game during work and to get touch with children because um, children are playing during the day. So um, we made a lot of jealous uh, other police officers because uh, we said, okay, our work now is to play on, on the game. So, but it worked. It worked. <laughs> and we, we had thanks to uh, Sony because uh, uh, they provide us a lot of um, a lot, a lot of material as uh, PlayStation 5, so <laughs> all our colleagues are more jealous. Um, and then it, uh, it, it's a, a very, very good tool also to go through the gaming, to um, do prevention campaign, to award kids that they, this is a very, very dangerous way also to play uh, without any protection and to the ways to uh, alert them that they have to be very, very um, pay attention to with who they are uh, playing. So it's a very good way, gaming is a very good way to protect kids and this experience was very useful for kids but also for police officers. Thank you. So, thank you very much for this uh, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think before we move into the debate, I would invite uh, Greg to compliment uh, and, and broaden the uh, horizon a bit. Greg, uh, would you like to come here to present? It's maybe, uh, yeah, or are you okay yeah, there? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Thank you very much, Jan. Can you put, uh, yeah, you have it, excellent. So, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Muni. I'm working with Jan at the uh, European uh, Law Enforcement Agency called Europol. Um, in my job, I am leading the Europol Innovation Lab. So what is the Europol Innovation Lab? This is a new entity. It's a team of uh, many different, uh, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team. We've got engineers, we've got uh, coders, developers, testers also project managers, lawyers, political scientists, and we're trying to promote innovations in the field of internal security for the European law enforcement community, make sure that they uh, make the most of new technologies in their investigations, uh, and also find synergies. There's no point in every member state building their own AI tools to do automatic translations. Uh, we can do it in one country and then maybe share uh, tools and codes together so that we are more efficient, really trying to raise the level of, of, of the efficiency of the police. Um, another aspect of uh, the Innovation Lab is also to look ahead, look, try to anticipate the impact of new technologies on policing and on crime. Um, and this is something that I'm going to, to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, one of the newest field of research that the observatory is, 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 is looking into, and this is policing the metaverse. So it's really complementary to what my colleagues have just uh, explained. Actually, I'm very happy uh, to learn that there are uh, new opportunities to continue to develop this project. Um, as uh, Veronique said, uh, Europol awarded the uh, first um, Europol Innovation Award to this project because we thought it was really, really innovative. And it's really going with history. I mean, our life is going more digital. I mean, you've, you're all expert in this. I'm not going to tell you again about those arguments. But this is really happening. And when you think about the metaverse, reality and, virtu and virtual world will be more and more indistinguishable. Uh, I've tried this one several times. Um, but basic, basically becoming blurry. And I think it's really, really important that policies pra policing practices are also evolving with our um, digital environments and with our new way of, uh, of life, basically. And, the, and the, the project that we've just uh, heard about is really one of the most innovative, really at the forefront of this evolution. 
And I think that this innovation should not stay um, you know, a single project. They have to be disseminated widely in society. And I think we need to make this type of project the norm, in fact. And, and most um, uh, digital environments should have their own police station where citizens can report crime, can share um, things that are happening. It also make the investigator more efficient. I forgot to go ahead with my slides. This is really just uh, the slides on the, on the innovation lab, but I've already talked to you about it. One of the latest reports that we've, we've done um, at the lab was to look into deepfake. Uh, you can find report that goes more into um, the details of the technology of deep, deep fakes and the impact and the challenges it has on crime and, and law enforcement. But this is really a report drafted by law enforcement for law enforcement that we made public as well. It gives you a nice state of play of the different uh, uh, deep fake identification technologies and how criminals are, are using them and where the, the trends is going. And now we are starting a new project on the metaverse and on policing the metaverse, and this is what I'm going to, to tell you a little bit about. You already know Europe has already this innovation awards to uh, Undercover Avatar. What we're also doing in terms of follow-up, in terms of innovations, is to uh, organize and invite uh, people like these colleagues or others to Europol to pitch new innovation, um, innovative solutions in what we call the innovation demo series. And then we share uh, nice tools, nice best practices of policing in the digital environment with others so that we can um, um, set good practices and, and good examples. This is just a, a quick uh, screenshot of a series we had on digital crime scene. So this is a, a software that the French Gendarmerie has developed where you can scan a crime scene and then you can annotate it using virtual reality. It's not completely new, but this is really a software for law enforcement. And, and again, it is made available through the Innovation Lab to other national police forces. So now digging more into the, the topic, again, I know that in the audience you have some experts on the metaverse. What is really the metaverse? Well, it's, it's actually a mixture of different existing technologies and technologies that are developing. We're talking, of course, about virtual reality, but it goes beyond. It's also the metaverse was also made possible because of the new decentralized finances. All the blockchain technology appearing, being, becoming mainstream. Uh, the fact that now you can uh, coin uh, ownership and property in the digital environment with NFTs. Uh, it's, it's going beyond. Um, you have, of course, the social platforms. You have the experience of the gaming in industry that comes into play. Um, and, and the wearable devices as well. So this is really coming all together. And at the end, you have uh, an immersive... A very inter interactive and persistent uh, virtual 3D worlds uh, that is connecting different digital environments and spaces and where people can interact with avatars. That's really you know, a, a large definition, but I think this is um, um, quite illustrative of, of what the metaverse is, actually. You have three main digital uh, techni technological barriers that are in the progress of fooling. Um, and making the whole metaverse experience um, uh, tangible now. These are the latency, the bandwidth, and the resilience of the networks. And specialists believe and they anticipate that in the next 10 years, uh, really, we will be at a stage where the metaverse is heavily used by pretty much all the internet users now. And the, and the difference between virtual and reality will really, really be uh, blurry. And that, uh, from that um, um, uh, aspect, we from the police are, are identifying a number of threats and a, a number of um, uh, problems that the society will have unless we anticipate a number of things. Um, so one of the main uh, characteristics of the metaverse is indeed the social interaction. So the question we're asking ourselves is, are we going to see exactly the same problems that we see, for instance, on gaming platforms, on social media, I'm talking about uh, disinformation, about uh, cyber bullying, bu bullying sorry, and many others, but demultiplied because of the new environment, or are we going to see new threats coming, um, things that we haven't even anticipated? Uh, so that's something that we're trying to, to look into now. I don't really have the answer, but I think we can already um, um, uh, anticipate a number of threats. The first one, and it's just, I will just uh, mention four. The first one really is uh, the data protection aspect. We are at the, at the conference on data protection, so I think it's really important to, to emphasize the fact that, and again, some of you already know, but virtual reality and the metaverse goes beyond the 2D and digital environments we are used to now. Uh, the number of 
data protection points that will be made available to the industry and to all those who are building the infrastructure will, will, will um, be um, um, much higher. Um, the metaverse is working based on mixed reality, and mixed reality also means that you have a lot more sensors. You have sensors for your face, you have sensors for your gesture, you have sensors about how you feel, um, you will have sensors about where you're looking at, what you're thinking about. I mean, some companies now are trying to um, integrate, um, um, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, the name in English. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost the same in fact. No, electroencephalogram. So, you know, trying to monitor the pattern of your, of your brain, basically. And all those, of course, even according to GDPR definitions, are uh, uh, um, uh, personal data, because if you gather them, then you can link it to an individual. And all these um, uh, data points will give an even more power, give even more power to the industry to profile people and to target even more your advertisements. So this is something that we need to, to, to be aware of. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm not even mentioning the, the, the potential for intrusive surveillance. I mean, we already complained about the internet, but just wait for the metaverse. Once the whole infrastructure be belongs to, to, to entities which we don't control in, in an unregulated environment with all those data protection uh, data, uh, uh, points being gathered, uh, there's a massive risk. Another question, of course, is are the regulations and legislations in place now, thinking GDPR in particular, can you apply them in the metaverse? Or are we now at a stage where uh, we need to do some adjustment? I mean, I'm not an expert in the GDPR, but I know that, for instance, GDPR will apply to personal data process on individuals that are based in the EU. So you have this territorial aspect. When you are in the metaverse, first of all, it will be very difficult to identify whether that avatar and the person behind is actually based in, in, in the European Union. And also, in the metaverse, you also, by definition, goes into virtual environments which are not in the European Union. So that's the question, to see whether in the next coming uh, um, years we will need to amend and, and adjust existing regulation. Um, another aspect um, that, are, that we are thinking in terms of threats is really identity theft, theft and impersonation. We all talk about deepfake and how technology is evolving really quite quickly with AI, um, but impersonation in the metaverse also means that exactly like Fabrice mentioned, you have your own avatar, but first of all, who does it belong to? Does it belong to the company that gave it to you, or is it, you know, belongs to you because you built it? Um, if somebody impersonates you and creates the same avatar, who do you turn to? And if that person who has your own avatar goes and do digital crime, um, you know, then you have a bit of an issue as well. Um, so I think it's important to, to keep this in mind, uh, and we would need to anticipate this type of, of situation. Um, another aspect, of course, is the, um, the fact that with the NFT on the metaverse, you have property coins and you, you can own things in the digital environment. But how do you protect it? That's also an issue. Who do you turn to if somebody just steals your space on the sandbox, for instance, that you, you paid several millions? Well, I suppose if you paid several millions, you're quite safe. But if you, own your, you have your own space and somebody take it from you, then you don't know. The same goes with financial crime. Um, uh, already... Uh, with Second Life in the 2000s, a number of police organizations, in particular the UK National Crime Agency, had opened a number of investigations in terms of um, uh, money laundering. So Second Life was used to launder money. And so now that you have the, end, uh, the blockchain technology working so well on all the cryptocurrencies, then we believe that Metaverse will definitely be a place where uh, money laundering and, and other uh, um, uh, financial tra transaction will take place and will need to, to, to monitor. Another aspect is, and that's the third uh, threat that we uh, are in the process of identifying, is disinformation and the threat to democratic values. We all complained about uh, uh, social media and the, f and, and the impact it had on disinformation. Uh, but then, if you think in terms of political dis destabilization, um, uh, uh, if the US elections were played on Facebook in 2008, on Twitter in 2016 and 20, then could the metaverse be the place where you get elected in 2028, for instance? And then if you, if you think in terms of extremism, online radicalizations, on the metaverse, you can really experiment because you are immersed in a digital environment and you can also be transported 
in, for instance, in the war zone. So if you are a young um, individual looking for models and then you get in, in contact with radicals and then they take you to war zone to really experiment the suffering of victims and everything, I think that the potential for radicalizations will again be demultiplied on, on the metaverse. So that's also something we need to, to take into consideration. And the last threat um, is crime against persons. And now going back to the first presentations about child abuse online, um, um, I, I think that th there were a number of examples already in 2007 when Avatar in Second Life was allegedly raped, uh, has raped another one, and there was an investigation by the Belgian police. Uh, the same happened uh, recently on the metaverse as well. Um, so these are also things that we need to, need to take into consideration. Are we in a place now with the police? Can we provide the public service of, of safety to our citizens in digital environments? And these digital environments will we, we, we'll grow ahead. Looking at the, do you have two or three more minutes? Or sure. Yeah. So I'll just conclude really briefly on, on um, so that was just about radicalizations and, and, and the impact on the metaverse. Um, I just want to quickly say a few things about what we're trying to do. We're only at, really at the beginning of how the police is moving ahead. Um, uh, the Enfant Bleu is definitely one of the most innovative uh, um, initiative. Now at Europe, we're trying to gather a number of uh, member states who, who do have experience, like the French police in particular, but the, the Nordic countries are also quite uh, way ahead. And we, what we do usually is we create core groups to look into a technology, develop a tools. We have strategic core groups on artificial intelligence, technology and ethics, horizon scanning, virtual reality. And last week, we established one on policing online. Um, and I want to pay tribute as well to the Norwegian police. Uh, in 2021, they did a survey where they found out that uh, the Norwegian citizens had like 80, over 80% 80 of trust in their police, great, and they felt super safe when they were in their normal environment. But moving in the digital world, more than 70% of the uh, respondents said that they didn't feel very safe. And so the police decided to take actions, exactly as the French police did with Avas and L'Enfant Bleu. They decided to start not policing a digital environment, but creating a presence of police so that people and victims could report crime. So they started to create local units with young police in and investigators. So this, they basically started with all the social media platforms. So you can, of course, find on Reddit, on, on, on TikTok, um, uh, an account from the Norwegian police. You have somebody who takes the report, somebody who does the investigations almost live, and somebody who gets back to the victims. Uh, this year, they started to create uh, presence on uh, Discord, on Warcraft, on uh, Fortnite, and, and others. And as of next year, they will start expanding their, their, their presence on the metaverse. So I think this is really one of the most uh, innovative as well um, uh, initiative. It, it builds upon the experience of the Enfant Bleu. And, and I think in the future, this is really something that we need to, to push on. Really, as a conclusion, I just want to make a small uh, d diversion to the uh, AI Act. Um, at Europol and the Innovation Lab, we've teamed up with a number of other EU agencies to try to develop accountability principle for AI and how it's used in the internal security. If you want to find out more, you can download the report. I'm saying this because even on the metaverse, we'll be building tools based, based on AI. And credibility and legitimacy of police actions is absolutely essential if we want to be providing uh, public safety services in terms of uh, to the citizen. And so we believe that accountability and transparency on the tools we're going to use, using machine learnings, using AI, um, have to be uh, compliant with higher standards. And this is one of our contribution to, to the debate of the AI Act. And if you're interested, you can download the report. Thank you very much for our attention. And um, the floor is yours. So first of all, a big uh, thank you to all the presenters for very good presentations, I believe. So I've already learned a lot. Uh, we, uh, we were learning about some shocking facts. You, you said every five days there's one uh, child uh, killed. Uh, that is what your statistics say. Um, uh, you told us more even 80% are victimized at home. This is, of course, very worrying, in particular in COVID times. Um, where you also said, okay, uh, kids, they disappear from the radar. They, uh, during the pandemic, they were not supposed to attend school. So bruises and marks and uh, let's say the scrutiny by teachers, all of that was gone. 
Um, yeah, trying to uh, draw links here to data protection, because when uh, preparing the panel also at the very beginning, Veronique said, but what does all of this have to do with data protection? Are you sure we are at the right conference there? And I said, yes, of course, no, definitely we are at the right place. Uh, because, uh, I mean, you spoke about grooming, uh, we have a business case here, or this is um, uh, all linked to minors being online, exposing themselves, their personal data on um, social media, but also in games. So these things are interlinked. Uh, but um, listening to Greg now, when preparing for this panel, I was hoping that I could also earn some brownie points here from the CPDP community along the lines of, look what we are doing. This is not machine learning and not AI, but we are putting the classical detective work uh, into the digital domain. So this is also what we can do. From Greg, uh, looking at Greg's slide, I already understand, uh, okay, we're not going to get away without AI and machine learning. That's at least your estimate. So before opening the floor to the audience, maybe to Veronique, like um, that was a huge success, I understand. But would you see it as an alternative to AI and machine learning in policing? So the classical uh, uh, detective work turning digital or not? And in particular, I was also a bit disappointed when you said, when Fabrice said, this was an excellent project, but we cannot continue it because it's too resource intense. Then I also think to myself, well, man, this is sad. Then do we need, don't we need more of these resources then? Because that looked amazing, at least to me, also from a data protection perspective. So maybe to Veronique first question. The thing is we act very, uh, that, that was an urgent thing to put in place because uh, we were aware of the lockdown. Uh, the day for another, and then we we knew that uh, children won't be able to alert for uh, the, the the threat they they are confronted to, um, and uh, they are they will have no way to to talk to anybody uh, external to the family. So this great idea pop up, and then uh, we said let's. Let's do it, and we will see the issues after all. And uh, the, the volunteers uh, which, uh, who grab all the information concerning the kids um, signed a charter uh, of confidentiality, so they won't share any personal metadata. And then if we had clues through the interview uh, by the volunteers to uh, identify the kids and the location. Everything was immediately sent to the prosecutor, so he had in, in, in his hand all the m personal metadata. So that, that's one of the issues that we have to work on on our uh, expert group. Uh, right now, because that, that's first we had not enough volunteer, and we couldn't uh, ask them to work 27 hours a day during seven a day a week uh, for a long time. So we had to uh, stop the, the the avatar, the existence of the avatar. But uh, we had also this issue about uh, how to collect and, and, and store the, the personal uh, data protection metadata. So, um, yeah, we have to work on that, clearly. But our work as law enforcement was just police officer investigative uh, work, uh, finally. All, all the other uh, things through this project as... Uh, a digital machine and uh, AI and everything, we won't have to deal with that during the, 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 the existence of the project. Now we have to think about it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Veronique. I'm also, yeah, I look at the uh, floor and at, to the audience, there are already a lot of raised hands, which is great. I'm starting in the, in the front here with uh, Julia. Hi, uh, Julia from the Danish police and just to Jan, thank you for this panel because it's so great to have the other perspective 
uh, the very real threats that police actually try to face, the very real victims that we actually try to protect, and that data protection, of course, is one fundamental right that needs to be balanced with other fundamental rights, uh, uh, for example, the right to physical integrity and not to be harmed. So I think that's so important just that we don't forget this. I have um, two questions uh, with regards to your project um, and that one thing, and I think, I think it's uh, very short, you said that there was uh, 10 legislative um, proposals uh, with regards to the project, so I wanted to ask whether you needed to have a national legislation to start the project, to have the avatar, and then another project whether you said it was all quite spontaneously and the Danish police, we have also just uh, launched our own online patrol like the Kripos in uh, Norway. And here we already have a lot of the more technical data protection questions like, oh, is the company in the US, do we have to have a joint data uh, uh, a processor agreement? And, and how, uh, how closely were you working together with your DPO and the data protection um, department in setting up the project? Um, yeah, that would be something that I would be interested uh, in to hear a little bit more. Yeah, I think we're going to collect some questions before uh, we go back to the answers. So please just, uh, yeah, it would be nice if you could briefly introduce yourselves so that we also understand Hi. your background a bit. Thank you. Hi, thank you to all the panelists for this interesting um, presentation. My name is Saba. I'm from Leiden University. And I do have a question regarding um, the actual procedure that you took. Um, do you think that it was... A, it was an obstacle in front of you um, that Fortnite at least has an age verification that I think uh, those children that are under 13, um, they can't do it with, without parental consent. I'm not actually sure how it works in Fortnite. And also I have a question which my colleague also has. Thank you, uh, Saba. My name is Harun. I'm also with uh, Leiden University. Um, you, uh, you mentioned briefly this instance of the project was deemed too resource uh, intensive, so it was, uh, for lack of a better word, it was retired. Have there been have there been any discussions to partner with the game developers themselves, so Epic, for example, about making this a permanent feature and then employing moderators and staff? And then, as a as an addendum to that, Fortnite is known to have a very open world, uh, sandbox uh, type of gameplay. So have there been any discussions about expanding into other universes like the Minecraft universe? Because Minecraft ha does have um, a history of being used for unconventional purposes such as uh, the uncensored library. Thank you. I think, yeah, for now we play it back to the uh, panel and then we go back to the audience. So please guys, whoever would like to respond. Okay, I, want, I, want, I will answer concerning the legislation. Actually in France we don't we don't have to, um, this project could be uh, done without any specific legislation. The thing is, if we are undercover agent, we have to uh, respect some le legislation. And uh, in this way, uh, it, has be, uh, it has been a, a big issue for us to adapt the way we work, um, the way we work on, on for example, the dark net, the platform, the forum, and the chats, and in gaming. Because as it's, it's very precise, but as undercover agents in France, we can only uh, go through um, electronic communications. Uh, we can't do physical undercover. It's not my job. We have a special, other special agents to do so. And in gaming, you have to communicate by the voice, and for France, uh, this communication is physical communication. So uh, what is the efficiency of doing an undercover agent in gaming if we can't talk with the, with the guy who is, uh, we, we profile him as a pedo criminal? Uh, because as an uh, undercover agent, I, I'm a kid. So I have to communicate communicate and then I have also to have my voice, uh, not this one, another one as a, <laughs> as a teenager. So it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, after uh, we can rule these uh, issues, we, we can go uh, and work on gaming without any problems. Uh, um, 
trying to remember the question. Uh, regarding your question about the 10 legislative proposals, we, is, uh, we are trying to discuss and to make changes to express gaming is a space uh, that can help children. Uh, so that's the proposal we are working on it with the French government. Uh, for example, one of the proposals is uh, why could we create uh, like a, a splash screen before each video game in Europe, uh, explaining like, uh, I don't know the name in English, but uh, when you're epileptic, you have always, uh, when you enter a video game, you have to be careful, uh, don't stay uh, too long in, in the screen, etc. Uh, maybe we could have something explaining, okay, if you're witness, of, if you're victim of um, abuse, uh, just call a European number or just go to this website, not for the association, but like something supported by the French government or by the Europe. Uh, so that was for your question. Um, And sometimes you would, uh, because it's, yeah, you mentioned some of the things like data collected, who's it? So I was just wondering whether in France uh, the legislator deemed it necessary to, to say, okay, this is so specific no. and we need to allow mm. the police no. to do this, so we need an executive order or something no. in that sense. No, no, no okay. we don't have, we, do, we didn't uh, need this. Okay. No. Uh, and now regarding your other question, you're right, uh, you can play Fortnite alone if you're under 13, uh, but it's you can't play but there are a lot of children under 13 that play so uh, once again uh, the law is 13 but uh, we we all know uh, and we all know in maybe you have a nephew or brother or sister and they are 10 and they play to, to fortnite so we we had to go there to help them and, and regarding the second question uh, about the other places we are totally uh, conscious that Fortnite is not the only game. Uh, we went to Fortnite because it's the most popular, because it's the game where there are the most people. Uh, but for example, and we totally know that, on Fortnite there are more boys than girls. Um, but we can go everywhere, and in, uh, as we say, it was like a, an experience and a test, and if it works on Fortnite, we're pretty sure it works on Animal Crossing, it works on FIFA, it works on uh, Minecraft or whatever. Uh, so we can't go everywhere, but we are. Uh, that's why we are making some legislative proposals to create some solutions to be everywhere. Um, and we are going to think about the sandbox and uh, other metaverse, but for the moment, we are not sure audience is big on this metaverse. So we all heard about sandbox. I'm not sure you even went to Sandbox or someone went to Sandbox in this audience. Everyone knows about it, but uh, there is not a lot of people inside for the moment. But we thought about Animal Crossing, for example, uh, for little girl, for little girl, sorry. It's uh, maybe efficient, but we can go everywhere. But uh, the, the case of uh, Norwegian police is very interesting to create some offices in different mm. places. I'm sure there are more questions in the audience, so just hand the mic as you wish. Thank you. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, Carlos Calleja from the Norwegian, University, Norwegian Police University College. Um, I have a couple of questions. So first, what's the error rate and how are false positives addressed? Um, because my take is that it's quite easy in the, on the internet to fake identities. So how are those false positives addressed when undercover, undercover police in uh, video games? And my second question is, uh, I would like you to comment a bit on the interventions following contact with children. Um, is it only reported to authorities or, are, uh, or do you envision any way of disrupting um, misbehavior on, on gaming platforms by, for instance, taking steps to ban users that are known to be engaged in grooming. Um, so thank you so much. Actually, uh, concerning the, your last question, um, we, it's one of our 10 proposition, legislative pro proposition to um, increase uh, the moderation on the video games because um, the human human um, 
uh, moderation, but also algorithmics uh, moderation, because uh, the the number of um, um, offender on video games are very, very. There is a lot of offenders on video games, and we need to um, be able, by moderation, to detect them first and then to ban them. They, the, 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 the games do it already. Uh, they are quite, uh, quite uh, active on this. Not enough, but there is because they are, they are not enough to do that job. Um, when we had uh, a, a target on the gaming as uh, undercover agent, we profile him uh, through the way he talks to us uh, the proposition he does, um, for example, if uh, he knows that I'm a, I'm a 11 or 12 little girl, and he said that he's 40 or 50, and he wants to talk about me in private uh, by Skype, we, we played already, and then he, he, he asked me to talk in private, uh, on Skype, on, on Discord, on, and ask if I have already had sex with someone, I know that this is a pedocriminal. And then I, I, I accept to go in private and then have a way to identify him. The thing is, the, the gaming is a way for those people to contact kids, but on gaming, uh, we can't identify them. So we find a way to go on another space to talk further and to, um, um, to be able to identify. Hi, uh, thank you for everything. My name is Laura Vasile. I'm also with the Leiden University and I have a couple of questions. One is a follow-up of your response, your previous response. So, um, do you feel that targeting and dealing um, with this type of offenses online should or would be easier if uh, the data protection regulation wouldn't uh, be such a big obstacle for uh, police working? And secondly, you were talking about something that we already have studied a bit in the Netherlands uh, through Sweetie, because this is what they did. But um, their main issue was the fact that uh, manipulating and investigating was uh, the main obstacle in this. How do you feel that the law could further or uh, probably in the future deal with it, what should we change about it? Thank you. I think data, collect, uh, data protection is, is good. I mean, as human, I'm, I want to be protected uh, when I'm on the, on the metaverse or whatever. Uh, I need to be protected. But in some case, very, very, um, uh, with the safe card, uh, we should be able to take off this protection because the the final um, <laughs> the final uh, thing that we want to protect is for my my case it's children. Then children and the safeguard of children is over everything else. But it's my law enforcement <laughs> specialist on 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 fight against child sexual abuse that, it, that talks right now. But, uh, but I mean, it, it, it can be found uh, a balance between those two objectives. I mean, uh, I think that was a very good question and also um, uh, thinking about it, to my viewpoint at least, the experiment you've learned about today was possible to be implemented in compliance with uh, applicable data protection rules. That is at least your perception. That is what you told us, like we could do it that way in France. 
if we talk in particular about child sexual abuse, uh, probably many of you are also aware of the latest commission proposal to say we uh, need to be able to scan each and every message for um, uh, content on uh, child sexual abuse, including in order to identify grooming. So here, I think that's maybe a more evident example where potentially um, a data protection uh, considerations clash uh, uh, with um, your intention to safeguard uh, victims of child sexual abuse because the potential collateral damage is way bigger than your experiment, because if I apply, let's say, a logic which we frequently run into when we discuss <laughs> tricky files with the EDPS at Europol, what we hear from them is your data protection impact assessment, your fundamental rights impact assessment needs to derive from the question like what could ever go wrong. And then I think if you look at this experiment, I mean, I'm open for your views and also curious, but probably in the end we can agree that with this experiment, less could go wrong than with an approach to say, in order to fight s child sexual abuse, from now on, we need to be able to scan through all messages each and every one of us is exchanging. So, and here, uh, Veronique, I, at least my viewpoint would be, I would be reluctant to say, well, it's for the good cause of fighting child sexual abuse and uh, price to pay. It is m more evident for me to say we need an in-depth uh, debate on what is currently a proposal, of course. For the sake of fairness, we need to say it's a proposal. So, you, just uh, if there are people in the background uh, from now on, also take a look because we distribute the microphone here. I don't want the people in the back of the room to feel disconnected, so you just need to wave harder, I believe, yeah, to make yourself uh, seen. Thank you. There's a lot of questions. No? Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Bilal. I'm from Leiden University as well. I wanted to ask this question connected to my what my colleague just said. Um, uh, instead of uh, expanding the scope of what Lang Fang Blue did to other platforms. Were there ever any thoughts of uh, changing the human aspect? You said it is too much of a work because too many resources, but were there ever any thoughts of changing the human aspect to maybe using AI? Because the capabilities of what AI ever could do to substitute what the, you know, what humans do, you know, but I know con conversation, conversation is a very important aspect when you, when you talk to a child but were there, do you think it's feasible if you change the human aspect to AI? Um, it's, it's a really good question. Um, yes, the, the, the fact it's a psychologue that talks directly to children is very important to, to get the message of the children. But I'm sure, uh, maybe not today, but with AI, and you have a lot of uh, conferences about AI today, and. Uh, and machine learning, etc. I'm pretty sure we could develop something uh, that could help the children. Um, when we, we set up this operation, we did it without, and I forgot to answer the other question, but we did it without uh, dealing with Epic Games, and we did it on our way, like uh, hacker way. Uh, but uh, we, we just entered the game and created our character. It was It's a very simple operation. We just had to create an account, a character, and speak with children. When we explain like that, it's easy and that's why we succeed in setting up the operation in, in some days. Um, if we want to create a, something more automatic, uh, it needs time, uh, we need time, we need some big partnerships with um, games editors, uh, with Epic, with Nintendo, with Sony. Um, we hope they, they would love to. Uh, when we did this operation, we received an email from the juridic department from Epic Games, and, and they told us we did not have the right to use the font of Fortnite. That was the only comment we had from Epic. Uh, that's why we use the font of Fortnite now in our presentation. Uh, but um, it, it was the only comment of Epic Games. So I'm not sure they are very, for the moment, they are very concerned about the operation. Uh, so we need to prove them that it's their they have to play a role in this uh, in this subject, and they have to help the associations. They have to help governments, and step by step, it's get, it's getting better. Uh, but it's important for them because 
by creating these things, they will make their games safer and safer, and they will, it's good for their business. So we need to convince and we need to explain what we did and what we did uh, hacking the game. Uh, and maybe in five years, in two years, three years, I don't know, maybe we could succeed in creating something more automatic and with uh, AI, it could be interesting and it could be a way to develop what we did uh, just 10 people in, a, in an office in Paris uh, and to make it worldwide. You have to be careful for the Jan, just, um, I think the, the, there's an opportunity for this actually to, to force the hand a little bit with the new proposal of the Commission on uh, child abuse. And you could argue that maybe the legislator would say that, yeah, in every platforms, online gaming platforms that are accessible to, to kids, you need to have a way of reporting abuse and so on using AI or other different, but, you know, having a legal base for that. And I think this, uh, this proposal is probably a, a good opportunity. So if there are any legislators <laughs> among the audience. We would love to have, we, we thought about that and when we thought about how we could improve that and, and create something uh, more stronger, we thought about creating a help button, yep. uh, emergency button, emergency um, thing in each game, each video game, and just you click on the button and you, you get in touch with, uh, with an association or with police or, or whatever, but just creating like this emergency button in every game, it's not so complicated, it could be uh, done, but I'm pretty sure, and I'm not from police or justice, and I'm just a citizen, but I'm pretty sure it, it will only function, it will only work if uh, it, we go by the law, because um, I don't imagine Sony or Nintendo or all the editors saying, okay, we are going to do that, and uh, we have to force a little bit the, the way. You have to be careful with the parents too, because if yeah. the parents say that, they can forbid them. They can say to the children, no, no way, no more no video games. Game. So we have to be careful with that too, because the parents know sometimes they are not agree with that. Mm. So this test was very good because nobody knows, no advertising, nothing. So we really have to be careful because if the parents know that, what's happened? So, so for once, we find ourselves in a situation where we say the parents should know and the kids <laughs> should be online out there alone. So that's yeah. also an interesting It's, it's very away. complicated. Yeah. It's yeah. very, very yeah. complicated because especially when there is no school. Because if you have school, it's okay because the children goes and goes to see a teacher and the teacher call police or association. But when it's locked down, that was very difficult. So now we have to work with the, the government, with the minister, all the ministers, uh, video game, but it's, it's so, so difficult. You know, I, uh, I think we are going to, to do a lot of things, but step by step, because of the law, because of the parents, because of everything. I've, I've just uh, been presented the five minutes uh, uh, sign already, and I'm afraid that this was four minutes ago. So um, <laughs> it, it's it's time to wrap up. But I also saw still that there are a number of questions. Still, I saw you raising your hand for very long. And I apologize, but uh, let's do it as follows. Um, uh, I think all of us are still here, so uh, we will be available to address any questions we couldn't answer now on stage for you bilaterally then. Um, many of us, I hope, will also stay still a bit longer. But for now, I would like to thank in particular our panelists, but also all of you who uh, actively contributed to the debate for this nice experience. I hope you have enjoyed it. I very much hope that I see at least some of you uh, on 19th and 20th of September in The Hague at Europol headquarters for the Eden Conference and uh, enjoy the rest of CPDP. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you. you.